All right. Super excited for today's episode. This is what I've been looking forward to a long time. We're going to have an expert, Ahish, coming in here, and he's going to critique some sales pitches that he's received and we've gotten from the community. So let's go ahead and pull those up, and then we'll go ahead and talk about some of those. So we'll have it on the screen for people to check it out. But I'd love to hear from your point of view as a recipient, as a marketing leader, what's going through your mind when you receive something like this? Yeah, now, a couple of things. And before we get into the specific, first of all, I sympathize with, with people who are doing the outreach, right? As marketers, we all do our outreach in one shape or form or the other over email, over, over LinkedIn invites. So I completely empathize with most of these outreach messages that, that come our way. Uh, that being said, there are some good ones and there are some not so good ones. So I would love to pick it up and go through it. What's going through my head when I get this? The first one is, oh, another one. Because the sheer volume of the messages that you get as a marketing leader is phenomenally high. Yeah. In fact, messages are the only good things I even read. If I get a call from a number that is not stored on my phone, I don't even pick it up. And I know a lot of my colleagues don't pick it up because we know it could be, it could be just somebody trying to sell their stuff. The other thing that's going through my mind is, is because there is so many of these volumes coming in and all of us are pressed for time, I'm just looking for something that catches my eye, something that, that, that get, grabs my attention, something that makes me want to read some more, something that I think would be useful as against just another plain vanilla outreach message. Yeah, That's the thing that I'm usually looking for. Yeah, absolutely. What are some of the things that, that catches your eye? You talked about if it catches your eye, then you're inclined to read more. Is it the first line? Is it like the format? Is it like the visual? What are some of the things that, that captures your attention? Something, things that stand out for me is personalization is one. And not just who I am, but you know what my company does, understanding of that. What catches my eyes is good content coming through by a headline instead of jumping straight into a, hi, can I get a meeting from you? Some sort of upper funnel, middle funnel kind of, conversation pieces. And the other thing that catches my eyes is have I interacted with this person before? If it's on LinkedIn, usually I would see have we have had any history or have we engaged with us in the past, etc. Those are some of the things that, that I look for when I the first CMS is coming in. Awesome. So you said personalization, not only you know about you, about your company, but you talked about that it's a more top of the phone conversation. So top more middle versus the going straight for the jugular. And the third is if they've interacted with you before. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So with that in mind, I'd love to go through a couple of examples and just get your quick thoughts as someone who receives a message like this. What are some of the good things? What are some of the things they can improve upon? And once again, we're not calling anyone out. It's just more in terms of an opportunity for yeah. us to share our learnings and obviously get your point of view. Sure. So, so this is the first one, right? I think I got it a few months back. What I like about this one is it says that they're talking to somebody within my company, in my Europe organization, which is good. You always want to have some kind of social proof or referral coming into those messages. What would be nicer is would, if this person would have mentioned the name of that person, because oftentimes we have seen people just making stuff up, right? They are not talking to somebody in the EMEA team or they've been talking like six years ago. So if you're talking to somebody in the organization, you're reaching out to mention their name. There's a very good chance we would know the referee and that makes your job a lot more. I, I like the fact that it has mentioned, it has done some research, it has mentioned some of our competitors' names, some of our industry peers. That's good. That gives us credibility that you've had great partnerships with uh, these other guys. Uh, last but not least, the call to action, convenient time for 15, 20 minutes. That's everybody is asking for your time, but it's not the time that is, it's so instead of fitting me, most of these messaging platforms allow you to attach a document or attach a letter or something. So you can put that in the document. So have a read me if you want to discuss some more yeah. and that puts the onus on me to say hey listen i can read it at my comfort level and i'm going to look at it if i find it exciting i'm going to read that to that guy that's those are some of the things that stand out for me just this one very good point can i ask you on the last one the call to action what are your thoughts if two different approaches one of which is option one the person just submits the document in the link option two is the person ask you if you want access to a specific document is there a difference between the two or do you have a preference? Yeah, actually, that's a better. The second option is a better inbound way of reaching out. Because remember, sellers are working at their own time. So the person who's sending the outreach has their own timeline. I may not be in the market actively looking for a solution like this. Maybe I'll look at it and if it's exciting, I'll just file it in that if I need somebody selling leads again or somebody setting appointment meeting services again, I'll keep them in you. So yeah, the second one would work better, Jeff. Awesome. Glad to hear that. So highlight some of the key things you talked about. You mentioned that they mentioned they're in discussions with your EMEA team. You mentioned it would have been better if they would have 
added specific name. Another thing they did well is mention some of the uh, competitors, at least the people in your field. So give you a sense that they're familiar with the industry. And then to your point on the last one, the call to action, add some kind of resource and then ask them if you're interested um, to learn more, et cetera, et cetera. So awesome. Some great insight so far. I love it. Let's go on to the next one. Text is a little bit smaller. So this one is someone trying to get back in touch with them. He said, I tried to give you a ring recently about engaging with our content. I'm curious if you're just researching or an upcoming project that is require some informa further information. I and mean, it talks about so get in touch. Yeah. yeah, no, this one is interesting. Yeah, it mentions that I've been engaging with some content on their website. If it is true, they should mention it. That, hey, you read this white paper on our website. What did you think about it? Again, instead of going through initiatives and let's meet and discuss, I saw you read a white paper. Come across as a person and say, look, I saw you read this white paper. Would you like to know more? Or would you, uh, here's another piece of content that you might find useful after reading that white paper or watching that video or listening to that, or reading that blog. So get me on a journey before, again, asking me, asking to meet me. Because I'll meet only when I feel the need to meet somebody. If I'm in the market or I think I need to shortlist somebody. Great, great advice. So you talked about if they did understand you read something on the, their website, for example, call that out say, hey, you read this or you listened to this podcast, whatever it was, call that out in there. And then, as you said, maybe share something similar um, information or say, hey, would you like to find out more information about that? Now, can I ask you for the first point, do you think it's creepy if a company says, hey, I know you read three of our eBooks or I know you like, how, how far do you go in terms of what creeps you out versus what you find like comfortable and sp specific? <laughs> now, I think we do have a saying in marketing journey that right? never cross the creepy line. It's for the first time in, in marketing as a function that we've been industrialized to a level where we have a lot more insights about our customers than the sales organization or than even the customers sometimes themselves because somebody might be researching. To me, over time, customers, and especially in the marketing community, right? If you're a B2B marketer, things like retargeting, things like how people based on your consumption of something will give you the next thing to read, etc. So it doesn't really creep me out per se. If it if somebody says that, hey, listen, you read this white paper, that's good. It just shows me that you have a connected system from your, your online consumption, somebody has been tagged it, Somebody has followed up with it, did you it against the database or something? It just shows some initiative from my end, Joe, to say that, look, they are an organization that have some level of maturity in dealing with inbound leads. A lot of the times the outreach I get is for inbound leads, account-based marketing, personalization, database sales, et cetera. And all of these, you would be bet if they came across as somebody who understands all these concepts. So yeah, the short answer, it doesn't fit me out. Okay, I'm going to push the creepiness border just a little bit. And hypothetically, mm -hmm. let's say that you're active on Facebook or Twitter or some kind of more personal platform. And let's say that your plat your profile is, say, publicly open. And they see a photo of you on vacation with your family, for example. And they said, hey, yeah. I know you took a trip to Maldives. You know, how was it trip? It's like that? Does that, like, broach that that creepiness? Or, <laughs> okay. That, that crosses that 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 obliterates the, the creepy line, right? Because yeah. there's, there's something about deciphering intent. That's one thing, right? And if you decipher intent in a meaningful manner, in a manner that's mutually beneficial to both the organizations, that's good. But if you decipher intent, it goes into the stalking and screen scraping, those kinds of domains. That's definitely crossing a line. Like you wouldn't want to work with them, especially because in marketing, you've got to test a lot of these organizations with uh, PII data or, or cookie data. You wouldn't want to work with an organization that has practices that, that sounds borderline shady. Great point. I was just testing the waters, and that was obviously way out of bounds. So good reminder for everyone. Awesome insight so far. Let's see. So this is one. I, once again, I'm sure you get this all the time. I'm guessing this is you. someone received this right after. So, hey, great to find you on LinkedIn. How are you? I'm checking to see if you are exploring to help. So once again, this is just posing a question, th throwing something at the wall, see if it sticks. What are your thoughts on this? And this is a classic spray and play, right? This has got no context, no personalization, no value prop, nothing. It's just, I'm going to send out to 20,000 people and I hope a few of them respond to it. And the likelihood of this getting a response is really low because I don't see anything behind this. I absolutely agree. There's no, like you said, no personalization, no value prop. But so many folks still do this. I have no idea why. So I'm glad we're calling this out. I mean, the other one that happens is you go at an industry event and you're speaking at an industry event 
And then after that, people start adding you on LinkedIn. And it'll always be good to say, listen, I, I, I heard you say this, or I like this point. That's why I want to connect. Instead of just saying, oh, just connect. I, I guess it just, the odds of people getting accepted are much better if you show some initiative there. That's what I was going to ask you as well, too. Do you accept personalized? It sounds like you accept personalized invites more than like a blank invite. So, for example, if I someone sends you a connection request, which do you prefer? No, I would always prefer somebody putting this. I'm not asking war and peace. A, a line or two. Where did we meet? What did you like about? Why are you reaching out? How can you? a lot of them say, oh, we, could, we would like to explore areas of mutual interest. Just say, I'm not, say that, hey, I, I, I see you're interested in ABM. We have done a lot of work on ABM. Would love to connect. Something as simple as that is, is much more likely to get a favorable response. Yeah. Awesome. So like I said, if they saw an event or they heard you an interview or whatever it is, like if they saw that, use it as a trigger to reach out to you, include that in the message. Awesome. Great tip so far. Here's another one using a similar type of tactic. Hey, I know you previously engaged with our content. As you talked about, mention which content piece it is you may have forgotten. This one, I'm curious about the tone. It says, I'm curious to know more about blank, your company and your overall strategy. Let's see about this, a specific topic that you're interested in. This is for a different company that we received, but same kind of right. format. I'm interested to know more about you and your company. The reason I ask is because we work with numerous organizations in this capacity, helping them achieve some kind of KPI through blank. Would love to discover where you are and add value. How are you placed early next week? Yes, again, uh, fairly, fairly outreach message, right? What I would love to see in this one, Joe, is, is first of all, if you have engaged with your content, obviously do call it out, right? Uh, what about that content is exciting? You know, why did we read, write about that piece of content, et cetera, et cetera, that would help. The other thing here is if, you, if you're using LinkedIn, use LinkedIn to its full power, right? And on LinkedIn, you can see which industry I'm part of, who my competitors are, who am I connected with. If you have, by the way, if you and I have somebody in common on our LinkedIn request, by all means, add that in. But I was talking to Joe and Joe mentioned, maybe I should reach out to you. That's very powerful. Yes, that, that works. Or in this case, we should be able to see that this is cybersecurity. Here's top of mind to us. We saw a message earlier that, that did the basic work around cybersecurity, identified who the vendors were, and then maybe list a few of those out. That would be nice. Yeah, so it sounds like, once again, they are expecting you in this current message for you to do all the legwork. Tell me about you. But you're saying, look, do your research. Find out what kind of content I'm sharing. See who I'm connected to. Find out what my company is sharing on LinkedIn and other platforms. And use that as a trigger to reach out to me instead of just sending some generic messages like this. Exactly. Put the, show some show some effort so that it'll get, it's easier to reciprocate then. Yeah. And one thing that keeps popping up, I'm taking mental note of it as well, is names. You mentioned earlier the example of the EMEA. If you're working with someone in EMEA, who was it? If you're connected with one of my colleagues previously, who was that? For both mutual friends of Joe, mention that in, in the series, whatever it is, like the names thing, I don't think people really leverage enough. It, so I'm glad you mentioned that one. Awesome. So once again, same kind of tactic. I'm guessing this is an ABA ABM play. I'm currently working with different groups at your company to help make my meetings, presentations more engaging and impactful. I think your team could benefit from the success as well. <laughs> I see you shaking your head, so I'm going to let you go off on this one. <laughs> I mean, look, this one, this one just goes to junk mail, right? I mean, it just goes to the ignore file. Uh, there's nothing that jumps out for me here that says I should spend more than the time I've already spent reading that message. Yeah, I absolutely agree. No personalization whatsoever. Okay, this one I'm, I'm really excited to get your thoughts on because when we talk about triggers. Let's say you got promoted or you got a new role. It says, hey, congratulations on starting your new role. Okay, in this case, it says, ensure if you remember me, but I previously reached out to your time at your previous company. As you get settled in, would love to hear more about your strategies, what you're hoping to do, what technologies can support you, how are you placed for a brief call next week? What are your thoughts yep, on that? This is this is an interesting one. It shows that somebody has done a little bit of research, right? Of, of uh, I've started a new company, looked at my LinkedIn post and says, and it's also tapping into an emotional need that when you start a new role or any, at a new organization, you are looking for ideas. You are looking for things that you could bring to the table. So it, it does connect to that emotional need a little bit better than high you here and there. I like that in this approach, right? Here, what I would love to see is the thing that's top of mind of most execs when you're joining a new organization, it should show visible impact in a short period of time, right? In the first 90 days, you should be able to bring something of value to the table or have something to hang your quote on, says, look, that's my first 90 day thing. Highlight that. 
right? If you are going into that, bring it up. Say, look, we we work with with maybe so and or another exec who was in a similar position. We work with them to design an ABM program that within 90 days up the engagement level from X to Y. Then you are not just telling me that I feel where you're coming from or I feel where you are, but I'm also giving you something that you think could be or I think could be of value to you and makes it a lot more concrete. Remember again. When I'm in a new organization, the last thing I'm looking for is to network externally or to engage new people that I work. I have my hands full of meeting new people within the new organization or the new roles, settling down, et cetera, et cetera. So make it easy on the reader by giving them something concrete to say, okay, all right, that's something maybe I can I pick and run with. Great insights. Just to recap that, the first thing you talked about is the mindset you're in when you join a new organization. Now, most companies that you're doing in probation. So you, like you say, you need some quick wins. You need to showcase that you are doing something successful in the organization or more than likely you're out. So that's one. Um, and then you talked about share specific examples. Going back to what you mentioned earlier, if you worked with a peer, you worked with a similar company, mention that, not only that, but mention the results you got within that, that in that case, 90 day time frame. Because once again, you have 90 days in most organizations to pass for probation. Make it very time specific. Mention the specific results and mention the, the companies you worked with previously. Yep. And what would work is, uh, instead of saying I previously reached out to you during your time at Fortinet or whatever my previous organization was, previously, if we actually worked together, give some examples of that. If I ignored you the last time you reached out to me when I was at my previous organization, <laughs> without, without sounding mean, there's a high chance I'm not going to respond now. Right? So I think uh, maybe you should say this is what we did together or refresh the memory that, hey, this is something we discussed at least, yeah, not just with each. That's a very good point. So just to go on top of that, if, for example, they worked with your peers in different, let's say, different business units or different uh, geographies, is that worthwhile bringing that up and saying, hey, here's what we did yeah. for your colleague? Okay, got it. In fact, in a new organization, I may not know who all the players are. So if you can let me know that, they, remember the EMEA example, is they could say that we actually worked with your EMEA counterpart so and, and we did this piece of work for them, that gives me assurance that maybe you're set up as a vendor in the system. Maybe this organization already has an existing relationship with you. I'm more likely to engage and respond to that than just a blank, empty message. That is a very good point that I hadn't thought about as well, too, is if you already is set up as a vendor. Because most organizations, let's say, take three to six months to set you up. Yeah. You may completely miss out on the opportunity if, say, for example, in your probation, they say, hey, I got this great idea. You're like, okay, awesome, but it's going to take me another two to three months to get you set up. By the time you get set up, I may not be in this job anymore. So actually, wow, okay. That is another good insight as well, too. If you in the system, then leverage that. Mention that you're in the system because it makes your job easier as well, too, because you don't have to go through the back and forth of onboarding a new vendor, particularly, like you said, when you're starting a new organization. So many great tips in here. I'm loving this so far. Let's see. Ah, okay. This is another play, interesting play. So we talked about starting a new job. Hey, I noticed you're sponsoring this Blink event. Would you be interested in, this one's pretty like on the nose. Would you be interested in exploring commercial partnerships with our events? It says we run it with mostly strategic banking events, blah, blah, blah. What are your thoughts on this one? This one is interesting. So somebody has actually done the work, right? They probably saw us at an event. They saw, okay. And they've done the mapping because if I'm interested in financial services at one event, I'll probably be interested in this event, which was also aimed at financial services. So they, it's got a little bit more meat to it. What was interesting about this was they came, they sent me this message, I think a week before, 13th to 14th of September, which is, I think, for whatever the reason, a week is just not enough to evaluate and then come on board for an event that's you know happening in, in a week or 10 days, fine. That's one. But otherwise, this, this has got a good angle. I like this angle, right? That you... Because it's cross-selling with some relevance across uh, the audience, across the sectors we are interested in. What would be interested is why I would love to hear more about is why then. If you are interested in reaching out to banking customers, there are literally dozens of events happening in a quarter across. So what's unique with you in the banking space that we would love to work with you? That I would love to see that come out a little bit more in this. Yeah, very good point. Just to add on that, what are some of the things that you think would be unique? Is it like the specific audience? Is it the geography? Is it the topics they cover? What would be the draw for you to reach out, say, if they include that in here? The one that, that I find very useful is we ran this event last year, and these are the people who spoke, and these were the results that we had from last year. Right? And by the way, 
70% of the sponsors from last year are coming back again this year or 80% are coming back again this year. That shows me track record. That shows me that you're not just doing it overnight or you're not doing it for the first time, etc. So that always gets me of people doing similar kind of events and talking about the results that they have delivered. Got it. So once again, same kind of the tone here, similar events, similar kind of companies and the results. Now, I'm curious if they, because a lot of companies, they cannot disclose which company it is. If they say, let's say we worked with a, a similar company, Fortune 500, tech or banking, whatever it is in your space, and we did this results. Is that still powerful enough if they can't disclose the specific company? Anonymous, name? anonymous case studies or anonymous references. They have some value. It's better than having nothing on the table. But obviously, it's not the same as being able to name it. Because if you are able to take the name of the organization, by the way, even if it is not a competitor, yeah, that shows me you have that strength of relationship with your previous client that they have allowed you to use their name for your market, for your referencing purposes. That's powerful. That says that there is more to it than just a transactional relationship that you've had with the previous sponsor. If it's about sponsorship, that's public data. You go to that event website, you'll see all the sponsors' name there. So that shouldn't be a showstopper here. Got it. So I'm curious if there's any other clever ways. I think we have a few more in here, but I'm curious if there's any other triggers. So you talked about if you join a new job or you got promoted or they saw you speak in an event or if they saw you sponsoring an event. Are there any other like clever triggers that people have used to reach out to you to start a conversation? Those are the most of it, right? The other one is, People think in terms of, I sent out an email, did I get a response or not? It could be for a variety of reasons why I didn't respond. It could be for a say I'm not in the market or it's not relevant to me. Or maybe I just hired a vendor to do exactly that two days before I got this email. So there could be a variety of reasons. The other thing that gets me, and there's a fine line there between persistence and again, harassing or stalking somebody. But if you can have those meaningful hooks over a few months, over a few quarters, then you're more likely to catch me or to your recipient at a time when they are actually thinking about getting somebody for this service. If nothing else, it helps you build your brand engagement with them. Yeah. Or brand recall with them. Sorry. Yeah. Like you, like you said, it may not be, you may be interested, but it's maybe the right, right time. Maybe you hired someone else or, and, and so on. But I guess keeping that relationship open, as you talked about going back to your earlier point, if they are, maybe you say they're constantly engaging with your co content that you share on LinkedIn or other things, where they're attending your events and they're coming about it in a meaningful way, would that be a good way for them to continue that relationship, even if you're not ready to buy from them at that point? Yep, yep, that's fine. That's fine. In fact, a couple of weeks back, I finally thought we needed to look at a, a new set of agencies for our third-party database purposes. And you and I, we get like 15 of those emails in a day. Yeah. yeah. But I was finally at that moment, I was in, in, in the point of view that, okay, maybe we should explore some, whatever it is. And I was looking, who do I, so my team reached out and said, hey, do you know somebody that we can talk to? And I was thinking about it, I just thought about an organization that has been pinging me over the last few quarters, actually, that we do this. And every time they would reach out, they would come out with a new angle, a new story, a new, a mini caselet that we work with these guys, these are the results we drove, et cetera, et cetera. And these small nuggets of value, as long as you're not irritating the other person, I wouldn't block you. I wouldn't unfriend you. I would just let it be there. And in my mind, that's what name popped up and I asked my team, hey, maybe you guys should talk to these, these people. And I just did an introduction over email. So persistence, adding meaningful nuggets of value in every transaction that you do, it doesn't have to be close the deal in one mail, right? That, that goes a long way in remembering uh, who the organization is. That's a very good reminder for all enterprise, like I said, because you're probably not going to send one message, especially with you and get a reply instantly. Maybe you'd be very busy. But like you said, if you are going back to your earlier point, if you're keeping in touch, following up with what you're doing or your company's doing, you're sharing re relevant resources or insights on a regular basis, that's a good way to keep in touch with you and stay top of mind. Awesome. Let's see. The other one is a bit more... And once again, this is playing off the competitor one. Do you ever wonder what your, let's say your competitor's website is ranking and so on. In this case, yeah, they say what they do. We help optimize your website. But going back to a hook, if they reached out to say, hey, would you be interested in what your competitors are up to? Is that a enticing enough hook for you if they mention them in that, specific, in that email? I would, what I would find more powerful is, look, if you're you doing SEO services, if you're doing SEM services, like, what I found most powerful is when you can give me a lightweight taste of what the service already is. 
So you generically saying, do you know how you're doing compared to your competitor? I probably do that already. Maybe you should come into the manual and say, listen, we did some lightweight assessment. And here are the areas where we think your website is doing a phenomenal job. And here are a couple of areas where we think you're, you're probably lacking. It doesn't take, it doesn't have to be a full-blown assessment, et cetera. I know that's not scalable. But something lightweight, a nugget that says, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Maybe I'm falling behind on my, my, my open, my response time of the website by a few seconds. And that's critical. So give me something that, that shows me that you have looked at my website because you're an expert at SEO mm-hmm. and you have found something worthy of catching my attention. Got it. So just to recap, include the insight in the message itself. Like I said, if it's your page loading time is 20% slower than your competitors or whatever it is, just list that maybe in bullet points or bold it, what the insight is. Okay. That's another good point rather than saying, Hey, would you like to know what? Yeah. yeah, Give it a sneak peek, right? Make it a, make it like a movie trailer. Give it a sneak peek. It doesn't have to be the full report, but something that, that catches your attention. Yes. I'm getting that thing with just spell it out. Like I said, you don't have much time, spell it out, whether it is a case study mention the company, the name, or if it's something that you observed from their marketing, or their website, include that in there as a bullet point, or as like I said, a sneak peek. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. One more thing I wanted to catch your thoughts on is a type of format because everyone is sending messages like this. What are your thoughts on if you received, let's say a voice memo or a voice message or a video message versus text? Does either, do you have a preference for any of them or what are your thoughts on those? Video messages are cute. Okay. Probably not worth the time, right? You want to get to it as simple as possible with a few texts. And I don't know anyone who will still read their voicemail or voice messages. I doubt it, right? Voice messages could be unique. I've never tried them out. Maybe a short video introduction would be an interesting one as well. I haven't seen those. Yeah, but maybe some sort of rich media in the outreach would help. Yeah, so this is something we've toyed around with previous clients as well too, is you send something like a text because it's easier to scan and read, but let's say they don't follow up. And I do this with people because I'm constantly on the go because LinkedIn allows you to send voice messages. So sometimes if I'm trying to reply to someone and I can reply faster in a voice and I can't text, then I'll just do it. Some people like it. Some people don't even- Yeah, I think it's a personal choice thing. If it works for you, it works for you. Yeah. Some people, but I don't have the best voice. So maybe if I had a better voice, then I'd probably get more replies. But great that, insights. That's an interesting, sorry, that's yeah. an interesting angle. Like if you had a great voice. Many of these organizations, I wonder, they use, if you look at the profile picture of the person who has sent you that message, they use, they're trying to catch attention. So they're using non-professional backgrounds or casual photographs or sometimes even borderline flirtatious messages or a picture like that. That's a no-no, yeah? You do not want to go there. If anybody who's responding to that message, you probably don't want to work with them. And B, A, that's not, that's not the kind of an organization I would want my organization to be associated with or get, it doesn't get your credibility either. Yeah, it's a very good point in terms of not only the message, but also the, how professional the photo is because that's the only thing is the person's photo, the name, the company, the title maybe, and the message, that's it. Yep. Awesome. Please use professional photographs. The other one, maybe we could go to the next one and we can, we can come back to it. Yeah, I think there was one more that we missed. This one, but this one was pretty, pretty generic that I don't know if there's anything good to, to highlight from it. Nah. Yeah. But I just wanted to, to recap some of the, the key points. You talk, so if we're breaking this down line by line, and let's say that the first message is a is personalized. Like you said, they saw you speak at an event or they read about your news or whatever it is, just like promotion. Use that as the first line. Is that right? Yeah. And then in the body itself, you mentioned get straight to the point, whether it is a resource you might enjoy or it's a mini case study, just highlighting the company and the name, or it's an insight that you found from doing research on the company and so on. Highlight that. And then... This is where I think a lot of people struggle as well, too. I mean, you can see it's all over the place is the question is the call to action. And I think, you know, I give the example of, would you like to find out more about X, but that's a content resource. What are your thoughts on those? Okay. Here's a broad one. How are you placed for a call next week? Yeah. Do you have any time next Tuesday or Wednesday? Let me know what's convenient for a 15 or 20 minute call. What are your thoughts? Cause we haven't really talked too much about the final like, call to action. What's your preference for that? My, my, and this could be a personal preference, right? If it's the first time you're reaching out, unless it's a really compelling value, I probably wouldn't be getting on a call with the person who sent that message. What I would love to see as a call to action is the permission to stay in touch, the permission to keep sending me these nuggets. And you don't have to have that permission. You can always send me that message. 
as long as we are connected on LinkedIn. But just the fact that you mention it, listen, I know you might be busy. Is it okay if I keep sending you a couple of messages once a month or once in a few weeks? By the way, at any point you want to reach out and connect to me, just give me a holler at this number. You know, something like that. It, it gives you permission to keep on engaging with that person instead of if you don't pick up my call. Because if you do a call, all right, if the call to action is get on a call with me next week. If I don't get on a call with me next week, that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. That you got nothing to get back to in the room with the person you're sending it to. To keep the channels open and at the same time show the, the, give them the impression that you are here at any point when you are ready to talk. And some I, people put timelines next week or... Yeah. Or, uh, the one that I've gotten is, here is my, my calendar invite. You can go and find an empty spot for yourself and book a meeting with me. <laughs> it's just too presumptuous. It just doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. We don't, I love that because this is something I talk about as well too, is like consent and you call permission-based kind of responses. I love that. Like reaching out to say, Hey, is it okay if I send you a message like once a month on a resource, blah, 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 blah. You know, no rush at all. If you want to catch up or you want to talk, just here's my number, here's my email, whatever. It's once again, it completely changes the, the mindset of the recipient because as you can see from all of these, Hey, here's, do you have time next Tuesday? Do you have 15 minutes? Do you have 20 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. It's very much in favor of them. Or here's the worst. Here's my calendar link. Book some time with me. It's no, it's like you as the buyer have the power and control to say, okay, I would like to speak with you then. Otherwise, like it's very one-sided or very presumptuous, as you mentioned. So Rashish, I knew I was going to be blown away. I was not surprised. I was definitely not let down by today's session. So many awesome tips. I've taken some mental notes as well. And I know a lot of folks who are going to be sharing this with their team. So thank you so much. No, thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. It was fun. It, it's always fun chatting with you and going through some of these messages. By the way, if you are one of these senders, just remember it is a grind. Yes, marketers, we all have to do a little bit of these, but make it more powerful and you'll get much better responses. Thank you, Joe. Exactly. All right. Thank you guys so much. And we'll see you on the next episode of the BD Marketing Asia podcast.